we, we turn now to the uh, other presentations where Tommy will re respond to the preparations. Uh, first, we have Femi Taiwao, who is going to, in just in a moment, uh, give us his talk, Reconsidering Reparations. The timetable is that Femi will speak for perhaps 20 to 25 minutes. Then there'll be an exchange between Femi and Tommy for a few minutes. And then uh, we will have a Q&A as we've had before. And we finish on the half hour. So we have around about 50 minutes for this, uh, for this session. So Femi, um, delighted you can do this and handing over to you now. All right. Um... Thanks for having me. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, the chapter of um, the chapter that I sent to Tommy and to everybody else was um, the third chapter of a book I'm working on called Reconsidering Reparations, um, working subtitle Justice in the Area of Climate Change. And what I'm trying to argue for in this book is, or perhaps better stated, the motivation for this book is this slide right here. What you're seeing in the picture of this slide is a um, protest in North Carolina against um, a toxic landfill near a working class black community. And the origins of the sort of national scaling, national scope, environmental justice um, movement in the United States comes from protests like this one, um, also the United uh, Farm Workers um, under leaders like Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, um, who are fighting against working conditions and um, the use of pesticides and um, environmental toxins. There's, it's, a lot, it's just a particular way of saying that there's long been a connection between racial justice and the environmental justice movements. And the point of the book is to kind of reclaim that connection. I'm writing in the United States, so I often refer to US histories of racial justice, but um, the importantly from the book's perspective, we're talking in a global sense about racial justice, about climate justice and environmental justice. And what I'm trying to argue for is essentially a kind of change of subject. There's a good amount of people who are talking about reparations and there's a good amount of people who are talking about um, climate justice from a global perspective. And the book is trying to argue that these conversations should be the same. There should be heavier overlap between these kinds of conversations since an extended discussion of why it is that I think that's the case. So the broad perspective on world history that I'm coming from is a view that's called racial capitalism developed by um, people like Cedric Robinson, Oliver Cox, arguably Ruthie Gilmore as well. Um, and that is just a mobilization, a sort of theoretical position on why the world looks like it does. So why do you have this surprising fact on the left that um, three out of five Latino and black Americans live near a toxic waste site? There's a number of explanations for this. Um, here's one. Um, the global social structure that resulted from these things that kicked off in the 15th century, um, transatlantic slave trade, colonialism, which I think of as a sort of united set of historical processes. Um, there's a global social structure that resulted from that called global racial empire, which I just use as a shorthand. And it could be understood as a set of distributive processes, this uh, distributive system itself. And it has these tendencies just empirically, right? Advantages tend to accumulate in the global north racially and racially dominant communities. So whether those communities are within the global north or within the global south, the distributions tend to go to move in this direction. Um, that second bullet point should say disadvantages. Disadvantages accumulate in global south. So pollution, 
um, being a disadvantage, um, poor infrastructure being a disadvantage, those sorts of things tend to accumulate in racially disadvantaged communities, the global south. Um, and then the final point to this holds um, at various scales. So whether you're looking within a neighborhood or whether you're looking globally, um, some version of this tends to be true. Um, this is, um, as I've intimated, something of an empirical stance. I'm not taking any particular um, explanation as to why this is the case. Um, I'm not sure that there is a unified explanation as to why this will be the case that um, abstracts from the particular kind of disadvantage you're looking at or the particular, particular kind of advantage you're looking at. So I'm not explaining it via attitudes or via a story about institutions or via a story about constitutions. Um, it's just a broad empirical claim about what the world is like. So from that point of view of what the world is like, which I argue in the introductory chapters of the book, you come to this way of thinking about the global social structure. Um, it's the result of these historical processes, transatlantic slavery and colonialism. Um, and if those are the things that reparations are supposed to respond to, right, these world scale processes, arguably the first world scale processes, right, these processes that explain why we have a world scale process of politics. If reparations is a response to those things, then the task of reparations properly understood is no smaller. It's to rebuild the world. It's not to rebuild any particular country in the world, although rebuilding the world would involve um, a redistribution within countries perhaps, um, but the overall goal should be to rebuild the world. And this isn't just uh, a thing I'm coming up from the armchair. Um, Adam Gedichu, um, in her book, World Making After Empire, fantastic book, um, I think everyone should read, um, argues that this perspective on politics was something of a consensus or plurality position amongst anti-colonial activists, particularly the African anti-colonial activists of the 60s and 70s. So it was a very explicit effort to remake the world system. Um, it was alive in national independence struggles. It was alive in um, diplomatic struggles within the United Nations. Um, it was alive in the political struggles around supranational or international institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, so on and so forth. Um, and that is the kind of struggle uh, I'm arguing for as a reparations project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to contrast my view with a couple other ways of thinking about reparations, which are the harm repair view of reparations and the relationship repair view of reparations. Um, and then I'm going to say what my view is, the constructive view, which I'm taking from these activists during the 60s and 70s. And then I'm going to say practically what it means to take this view. So it's helpful because I think a lot of discussions about reparations include talking past each other. Um, it's helpful to at least say what we think the standards are um, and how we ought to adjudicate between them. Um, so there are a few desiderata, there are a few goals that we could have for a repara reparations argument or for a view on reparations or a perspective on reparations. Um, and I've arranged them here in, um, you know, what Rawls might call lexical priority, whatever that is, um, but essentially in order, right? Um, I think number one is the most important. I think number two is the second most important. I think number three is the third most important. Um, and so um, this first standard, reparations for global racial empire should make tangible differences in the material conditions of people's lives um, is the gold standard. Um, if a reparations, if a viewpoint on reparations achieves nothing else, it should achieve this. Um, I just take it that the raison d'etre, that why we care about reparations isn't just that it's true that there was an injustice in the past that hasn't been remedied, but the scale of what this injustice means, right? It's the living conditions that face um, the people who are descendants of slaves and descendants of the colonized that 
make us care about this particular injustice to the extent that we do. And that's the thing reparations ought to address first and foremost. Um, next, I think reparations should address the core moral wrongs of transatlantic slavery and colonialism, right? So it should redress the actual acts of enslavement and abduction and terrorism and plunder. And finally, reparations should discriminate. So how benefits and burdens from a reparations project are distributed, are parceled out, should have something to do with different kinds of standing um, with respect to the original moral crimes. And it's taken to be that um, the descendants of those who were enslaved should um, get more or get or be better positioned with respect to reparations projects than the descendants of the um, enslavers or, or the colonized and the colonizers, if you prefer. Um, for a variety of reasons, I think once you stare at that, that gets quite complicated, but it's something worth keeping in mind. So it makes it to the list of standards and I'm happy to talk more about this in Q&A. So the harm repair view is the view that reparations should repair present harms to individuals or groups that are caused or constituted by past harms, right? So it's something like the legal view, you're paying for damages. Um, often this comes with welfareist motivations and conception of harms. So um, the pain and suffering, the wage theft, the lack of opportunities for wealth accumulation and social capital accumulation, we understand the harms of reparations in these terms. And what reparations is for is to respond to these. And it tends to split populations up into something like a legal model. So plaintiff and defendant, white, black, advantaged and disadvantaged from this history. Um, as I intimated before, when I was talking about the third standard, I think these are actually quite different distinctions and they will split populations up in quite different ways, which is among the difficulties with this position. Um, but I don't wanna focus here. Um, so it's easier to just point to the standards. So harm repair would move money, wealth, other sorts of damages um, into the hands of the people on the plaintiff side, the people who are owed something. Um, so it would certainly make tangible differences in their lives. Um, because of the categorical difficulties, it's not clear how well it does with the second response, um, or sorry, um, because of the categorical difficulties, um, setting those aside, um, you think at least it's trying to do the third thing. So it does well on both of um, standards one and two. Um, paying damages doesn't clearly in and of itself address the core moral wrong understood in the way that I'm arguing as a distributive system, right? It's not clear that that distributive system goes away if every black person gets a check. Um, so if that's the core moral wrong, then it's not clear how well it responds to that, but it does make a tangible difference in people's lives to get a check. So it does well in category one or on standard one. Then there's the relationship repair arguments. So re reparations should repair damage to relations between groups caused or constituted by past wrongdoings. Um, so that's the idea that reparations should either pay a debt in which case it sounds much like the harm repair view, um, or that it should just um, provide a reason for the descendants of the enslaved and the descendants of enslavers to have more cordial, more citizen, fellow citizen-like relationships. Um, so one objection is that this changes the subject. Um, I won't read both of these, but if you uh, look at Coleman Hughes's response, um, Coleman Hughes talks about past apologies that there have been for slavery and Jim Crow um, and contrasts these apologies with um, other political projects we could pursue, perhaps safer neighborhoods and better schools and less punitive criminal justice system. Um, so, the, so one objection is that relationship repair views change the subject from being about pursuing justice in a structural sense to being about um, making us all friends again, 
Um, I don't think that's a terribly fair description of the relationship repair arguments, but um, I do think um, the propensity of relationship repair arguments to be mobilized in the direction of symbolic reparations makes it um, a bad bet on criteria one and two, um, but perhaps good on criteria and three since usually the right sorts of people end up making the apologies or doing some, something more substantive um, on a fairer representation of relationships. Um, happy to talk more in Q&A about deeper reasons why I don't like either of these views, but what I like to talk about mostly is the view that I do prefer, the constructive view. So on this view, uh, reparations is a political project to create the just world tomorrow and to distribute the costs of the things that we have to do today to build that world in light of yesterday's injustice. Right. So broadly speaking, it has these sorts of commitments. The point is construction, not repair. We're trying to build a thing in the future rather than um, respond to a bad thing that happened in the past. Um, it's based on distributive rather than retributive justice. So we're trying to build a system that distributes advantages and disadvantages in a just way, unlike the one we have at present. And it divides theoretical labor. So forward-looking considerations, the things that are um, considerations like equality in the abstract uh, might help us establish the target state of affairs, the kind of world we're trying to build. Um, but how we parcel out the transition costs, if you will, of doing that have to do with backward looking considerations. Whose job is it to build the infrastructure that we would have in the equal world? Well, that has to do with how you, what relation you stand to the transatlantic slavery and colonialism of the past. So global North white communities have to chip in their fair share where their fair share is determined in part by their relationship to past injustice. Um, so an initial question, distribution of what? Um, I take the capabilities approach. Um, I'm just going to say that in the interest of time. I'm happy to talk more about why I take the capabilities approach. Um, but here I wanna address a central tension to this approach or perceived central tension. So reparations accounts are backward looking and distribute, distributed justice accounts um, typically are construed as um, forward-looking, so in abstraction from what happened in the past. Um, I think this is a bad distinction. Um, social structure is an accumulated result of social processes. Um, the political structure we have now, how it functions is a result of the accumulated um, result of the past, things like wealth, our stocks accumulated from the past, things like political power are accumulated from the past. Um, so our responses are intertemporal in an important sense. So we're responding to the past and we're reshaping what the past means when we reshape social structures. So the vision is artificial. Um, so I don't think this view does super well on the third one, right? We're rebuilding, if we're building a just world, then everyone stands to gain from that in the final analysis, even if they have to do a little more work figuring this world about. Um, so it, this view doesn't discriminate that well, um, and some people won't like it for that reason. Um, but I think the view does exceptionally well on the first two criteria. It makes tangible differences in people's lives. It literally remakes the world on my view of what the world is, a distributive system. Um, and it responds directly to the core moral wrongs of transatlantic slavery and colonialism, which I understand to be how the current system distributes social advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so here's what we really need to talk about. Here's why this matters. Um, theory aside, what will it profit a parent to be able to send their children to an affordable school that's burned to the ground or underwater? Um, and a way to walk that kind of concrete thing back to a more 
recognizably theoretical thought is. How are we gonna protect even what little gains we have made on racial justice in a world three or four degrees warmer? A casual glance at um, climate science suggests that this is what's at stake. Um, climate impacts are not evenly distributed across the globe. Um, by some estimates, um, warming over the global south will be 1.5 or even twice as fast as other regions of the world. Um, and by 2070, some um, new estimates from scientists say that as much as a third of the world population will live outside of the climate niche that humans have thrived in for thousands of years, um, which will vastly redistribute the population in regular spatial senses, but also in the more recognizably political senses as people's ability to have even basic forms of security, food, water, and shelter um, will depend on politically how we respond to climate crisis. There's some theoretical reasons to think of those abstract non-raced stakes in these terms. Um, Ruthie Gilmore defines racism as the exploitation and production of group differentiated vulnerabilities to premature death. Um, I can't think of a thing that will more powerfully differentiate um, and produce different vulnerabilities to premature death than the climate crisis. Um, and um, people are already beginning to warn about, warn about climate apartheid, where um, the rich and politically powerful will be able to escape overheating hunger and conflict. And there's a non-accidental relationship between um, the rich and wealthy and the politically connected and the um, political geography of global north, global south, and white, black, and indigenous, right? And everyone... So I'm just going to list these in the interests of conversation, um, but we should think of distributive climate justice in constructive terms. We should think about building um, political structures that respond to the climate crisis. Um, and we should, overall those activities emphasize governance and the role of self-determination. So the fact that elites um, whether we're thinking of elites in terms of wealth or in terms of race or in terms, in terms of geopolitical regions, elites have captured our political processes. Um, and that is a situation that is entirely compatible and in fact will guarantee climate apartheid of the ugliest kinds. Um, unless and until we challenge that basic structure, none of our other responses have any chance of success. We should be looking at these targets amongst others. We should be looking at immigration justice. Um, if one third of the population will need to move, then the political structures that determine movement will be vastly decisive of who and what survives. Um, police violence, um, that's um, a lot to get into, but basically I understand the police as um, an institution that functions to distribute risk downwards towards the politically disempowered. Um, so we will need to contend with that if we want anything um, that will look like justice and not like climate apartheid. Um, we will need to adjust some global transnational and supranational funding questions. So the Green Climate Fund, which is supposed to fund um, climate mitigation and adaptation in the global south is vastly underfunded, partially because um, there is um, roughly five or six U.S. military apparatuses worth of hidden money, um, essentially stolen from the global economic system sitting in tax havens. Probably have to do something about that. Um, and in general, when we're thinking about climate responsibility, climate mitigation, carbon removal, all these sorts of climate policies, we're going to have to think in reparative terms about how we distribute the costs, benefits, and burdens of these actions. Um, and finally, I just want to mention these two things, tactics and strategies for how we can um, get these things going. There's an approach called bargaining for the common good, which has been used by uh, most famously, perhaps by the Chicago Teachers Union, but that's when um, workers bargain collectively over demands that are of um, broader significance for 
community and not just workplace conditions. So that can build a way to check back against elite control and community control as a principle of governance and as a um, goal perhaps for community worker combined organizing. Um, we should want to govern as much of the world as we can by um, sortition or random selection of citizens citizens assemblies. We should want to govern science that way. We should want public ownership of utilities and powers and to get in and power generation, get those out of elite hands, so on and so forth. All of this is just to say in practical terms, this sentence that I said at the beginning. Um, I'm less arguing for a particular theoretical perspective on reparations than I am arguing for a change of subject. Um, I think these are the things, the things I just listed about climate policy. These are the things that we have to start talking about if we want racial justice um, to be an actual feature of the world, as opposed to if we want to analyze what race, um, what racial justice, different ways of thinking about racial justice. If we want to move from that to sort of concrete set of goals, objectives and targets, then I think we have to start thinking about climate justice. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for the uh, really wonderful and thought provoking presentation. Um, so what we will do now is um, hand over to Tommy to ask you uh, a question or two. There'll be a little bit of dialogue perhaps between the two of you and then we'll move over to the Q&A. But just to remind participants, um, if you have a question please use the Q&A function. You just type your question into the Q&A. And if you see a question you like there, um, upvote it so it has more chance of making it to be uh, to the session. So Tommy, over to you now. Thanks. Um, this is great, Tommy. Um, I can't see you now for some reason. <laughs> but, uh, oh, yeah, oh, there okay. You there you go. Uh, no, super interesting. I can't wait to read the book. Um, there's a lot going, lot going on, um, and it clearly, uh, I, I have a, a thousand questions, so maybe we'll get a chance to talk sometime. <laughs> well, um, so maybe one, maybe two, two questions. So one, when you talk about changing the subject, I can imagine someone thinking, um, is this largely rhetorical? That is, so there's race and reparations are topical um, thing. People tend to frame their justice claims in terms of race and reparations. And, um, and you want to uh, come into that conversation and, read, and, and kind of redirect it in a way to, to, other, to other things. Because I can imagine someone saying, well, it's not entirely clear that the, 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 the constructive view um, it's, not, it's not entirely clear where, where, why, why I talk of race and reparations is really needed to, to develop it, other than as a way of entering into an ongoing conversation where those ideas are resonant, um, because you kind of turn it pretty far away from where those discussions are. So I'm just, I guess I would, you know, the, the skeptical way of asking is that, well, what does race and reparations have to do with it? <laughs> Yeah, um, so I mean, obviously there is um, rhetoric in there, but I, I, I genuinely believe, um, and, and in the book, I actually focus on making the case just by describing the actual politics. But basically the thought goes something like this. Um, if you continue the reparations conversation on the um, terms that I take it to be going on now, so we're thinking about maybe um, changing education systems, we're thinking about um, uh, perhaps uh, broader anti-discrimination in job markets, student debt cancellation, so on and so forth. Um, though all obviously laudable goals, smart goals in their own way. But if you were, if you're to advance those as um, 
steps towards racial justice and the primarily important steps towards racial justice. I think what you're committed to thinking is that a world in which we cancel student debt and maybe even abolish um, prisons in 2020, let's say, but that is three degrees hotter by 2050 um, without any um, anticipatory policies in response to the new climate arena is a world where we secure those gains, right? So, so in the book, the way that I talk about this is I talk about radical reconstruction in the, in the US history. So the period after the Civil War where there was very fast social progress on a number of issues, there were black elected officials, um, there was talk about comprehensive land reform and things looked very rosy. And then there was a very strong backlash um, following an economic depression and some national political developments that erased um, and overruled the results of the previous decade, right? Or the previous period of US history. That's kind of the thought I have here. Um, if you don't have a comprehensive climate justice approach, even if you win things that will change um, maybe the racial justice level of the current social structure, um, I don't think it's plausible that um, when resources get scarce and when um, shit hits the fan, as it were, um, I don't think you have a political world in which those gains are sustained. Um, so that's kind of the that's kind of the reason why I think climate justice needs to be the focus. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's helpful. I mean, if you so so, I, I agree with you that the the world that we have has been um, created in part through the slave trade and colonialism, and it's kind of hard to understand that world without <laughs> highlighting that that history. Um, but I'm so, but I'm, I'm sort of wondering, it, it, it seems like the, if you'd like the, the, the backward looking dimension to it has to do with, so as we think about, we have a global justice vision, we want to reconstruct the world and we have to think about who's responsible for, um, carrying the weight of that, <laughs> of that enterprise, as it were, who has to, who, um, and so part, there's a, a question here about, um, so the way the world is, is due to a, a set of historical processes that includes um, uh, a shorthand, we could say racial capitalism, history of racial capitalism. Um, um, but I'm wondering, I mean, is the thought, uh, is it just a matter of, well, we, we have to distribute the burdens of creating the world we want to create in a way that's fair in light of uh, the, the burdens that have been posed by past injustice. That seems to be the, the core idea if I'm understanding it correctly. But then what see, I guess what I was having trouble with is that it seems like once you bring the historical dimension in, the, the, the question of responsibility for the world that we have gets much more complicated because it's like, you know, we're talking about things that went, some things way back in the past, some things more recent, the parties to that, um, many, many of whom are not uh, uh, even alive. Um, so I, I was having, a, 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 I was wondering if you could just clarify for us how you're thinking about the, the distributions of, distribution of the burden of construction or reconstruction um, in light of the responsibility for the world that we have. Because I was they were kind of coming apart for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I think they I think it's just true that they come apart. And my view is partially in response to that. So in the book, I um, when I take this objection up, I talk about the difference between responsibility and kind of, uh, you know, uh, so sort of an orthodox moral sense, right? So that typically involves some kind of causal responsibility as well, which is difficult to navigate backwards across generations um, and typically involve um, the appropriateness of certain reactive attitudes, which is um, again, hard to understand with something so intergenerational, right? Um, 
and I just think, um, I just want to leave responsibility by the wayside. I, I don't think it's um, at least conventionally understood. I don't think it's the right concept and I prefer liability, um, which is, um, you know, if you think of strict liability in a legal context, it's just the verdict that you must bear the costs, which often diverges quite radically from fault finding or blame. Um, and I think that's a better way to think about it because it just, you know, it just isn't true that the people on that side of the racial spectrum are um, descended from the wrongdoers and people on this side of the racial spectrum are descended from the victims. It just isn't. There's no way, there's no way to rescue this thought. The, you know, numbers of African empires were complicit in um, sending people or starting the wars that led to the abductions. Um, some European empires were not involved and um, these don't stand in any necessary causal relation to where people ended up later. Um, so, you know, it's just normal notions of moral responsibility are just irretrievable. And I think they're a burden on the racial discourse. So I think it's it's something more like um, something more akin to how we think about means testing. It's just regardless of how it is that you end, ended up here, if you ended up relatively privileged or relatively wealthy, you did so in a system that has this overall feature. Um, and so if you are a wealthier person, then relative to the global median, you have more responsibility, you have more liability to help deconstruct this system. I end up going for something like that. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll move now to the questions. So thank you, Tommy, for your questions and Tommy for your answers. And first of all, um, I'll ask Oshi, I think you can unmute yourself and uh, ask in person. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, yeah. Good stuff. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Just really, really interesting. Um, so my question, so I think that we kind of established through your presentation that capitalism firstly exacerbates climate change and also reinforces and maintains the oppression of a lot of racial minorities. So do you think it's possible to secure racial justice and to successfully address the problem of climate change without a complete abolition of capitalism? And so if you do think it's possible without completely abolishing capitalism, how do you kind of envision us achieving that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and it's, you know, I think, um, I kind of downplay the leftiness of my perspective <laughs> um, in the book because I'm, you know, trying to talk to people who don't necessarily share it. Um, but I think I'm agnostic. I'm principle. I'm agnostic in a principled sense on this question. Um, so I think it just flows out of what I think racial capitalism is that from a justice perspective, we have to dismantle it. And so in the final analysis, um, I'll, I'll blame racial capitalism for everything. I'll blame racial capitalism for, <laughs> you know, I, I have no problem with that. But the question about whether or not we have to dismantle it in order to stop climate change um, often gets cast in kind of moralizing terms, right? So is racial capitalism or just capitalism, is this responsible in a deep sense for the social processes that have led to climate crisis? Yeah, absolutely. Does it follow from that that um, it's incompatible with the continued existence of capitalism that we solve the climate crisis? Well, it's not clear, you know, one, um, those two questions are different questions, right? Um, and two, you know, this question has to do with a bunch of technical stuff that really doesn't directly have much to do with these political questions, right? So is the climate, is the global climate sensitivity 
um, towards the upper part of the range that we think it is or part of the lower or is it towards the lower end? If, it's, if the climate is more sensitive to carbon emissions than um, we would otherwise guess, then it seems you might get one answer, and if it's less, you might get another answer. So I think it's, it's, it's really a technical question about how it is that we're able to produce things um, and how that has to do with emissions. Um, and it's not really a political question in the deep sense. Okay, thank you. So we will now, uh, move to the questions from participants. Um, and the first of them is from Travis, who asks, can the shortcomings of the relationship repair view, i.e. changing the subject, be solved by construing relationships in the way that relational egalitarians think of them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think so. Um, so, um, in some conversations, I've been, um, some early conversations about these different views, I've been persuaded that the constructive view could really be thought of as a material, as just a material version of relationship repair. So it just ultimately comes down to what you think, what relationships you're trying to fix, and you can end up construing the basic distributive racial injustices in terms of political relationships, perhaps geopolitical political relationships, if you'd like. Um, but I'm a little, the usual context for this question is people trying to um, defend um the relationship repairs that have act repair versions of reparations arguments that have actually been offered um and so while i admit that they're conceptually compatible i would just also say that the people who push at least within academia the people who push relationship repair views just don't call for the broader world making thing um that i'm calling for they don't they don't call for um making the imf you know, do widespread debt cancellation. And they, um, I wouldn't say that down to an author, but generally um, this just isn't the argument that they make. So there might be some sociological incompatibility there, but um, conceptually they are compatible, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. That, that word repair is very interesting mm. because, it, because it seems to presuppose a normative standard of some sort of, of how things, how things were actually rather than how things ought to be right and, and, and maybe that's the difference between relationship repair taken naively and, and your own view because there never I was think so. there never was a time right yeah. right i absolutely yeah. think so yeah okay so, so let me take the next question we've got a question from david pina this is quite a long question uh, take the gold standard that people's lives should be improved as a result of reparations. I'm thinking now about a common objection raised against egalitarianism in the form of leveling down. Suppose that instead of using the resources destined for reparations, we were to use them in other ways, perhaps in ways that tend to grow the economy by considerable margins. Suppose also that we have a strong redistributive scheme such that people who have suffered from racism and colonialism would be better off under this second alternative. Is this a reason against reparations? Or would you say perhaps that reparations are still owed, even if people might not do as well as they otherwise might? Um, I think this is a decent objection um, to the harm repair view and probably also the relationship repair view. Um, I don't think it's a good objection to the constructive view of reparations because the constructive view of reparations just um, just is um, derivative of a world making project, right? Reparations is just the the sort of transitional distributive justice of getting from here to a world we'd want to be in. So I think um, implicit in that view is that um, that world would have to be more just than ours. Um, and I uh, make it a point in the book not to characterize that justice in egalitarian terms, right? So um, I don't think there's, I'm sympathetic to Amartya Sen's discussion 
um, and equality of what. Um, more sympathetic to the problem he raises than to the um, answer that he gives to it. But um, I, I just tend to be suspicious about egalitarianism as a criterion, for example, for exactly the reason you bring up here. So I just think we should figure out a desirable world, um, a just one, and build that. Um, and I don't think that is vulnerable to this objection. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question now from Johan Go. Uh, can we not adopt a hybrid or pluralist account incorporating the accounts of harm relationship repair alongside your constructive account? I'm not convinced that the constructive account is really in tension with either of the accounts you initially outlined. A plausible account of justice surely ought to consider harm relationship repair alongside the distribution of material conditions. Yeah, um, that's probably that's probably right, which is one of the reasons why, um, uh, as I referenced earlier, I conceded to people that you could think of the constructive view as sort of a materially focused version of relationship repair. Um, I, I disagree with the second paragraph that you say here, actually. Um, so I think some of the important um, early expositors of something like the constructive view were nationalists and separatists um, who thought that, um, for example, the Republic of New Africa, um, some of the anti-colonial activists who thought that it would be enough that um, if they could have their own land and self-determination of a thorough kind um, over and within that territory, that that would be um, good enough if that were financed by the offending power, um, which I'm sympathetic to. Um, but I, but I, as I said, I, I don't think the constructive view is a necessary conceptual tension with at least the relationship repair view, um, and they might well be compatible. Okay, so, so quickly then we'll take a, a last question from Katerina, who begins, thank you for your talk, I found it very interesting. I was wondering if there will be a trade-off between disadvantaged groups, immigrants, Black communities, Latin communities, etc., and the scope of justice, global versus national level? Or can the procedure of achieving justice be designed to handle these tensions through, e.g., something like greater priority to the worst off within these groups and compensation for the incurred costs, not necessarily just monetary compensation, but maybe other compensation in other forms too? Or is there an alternative solution in the vicinity? Yeah, I think um, the kind of um, I think the kind of position you outline it's going to be more or less what it will need to look like. So um, I don't think um, I, this is part of the motivation behind characterizing the target as a just world as opposed to just compensation for. Um, compensation for past injustice, because you can compensate people for past injustice in ways that um, injure third parties or even the parties themselves in ways that are um, irreconcilable with justice. So I have in mind um, something like um, the plunder that was part and parcel of the Rw Rwandan genocide, or to use a more controversial example, um, Israel with relationship to the Palestinians, right? So it's not just a response to injustice, but the response has to itself meet criteria of justice. And I think um, what you say here about um, how you prioritize the worst off within and across groups and compensate for incurred costs uh, would be part and parcel of doing that justly. Okay. So I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, so I, I believe there may be some other questions in Q&A we didn't get to. So those will be sent on uh, to Femi. Um, so let me thank Femi again for a wonderful talk and Tommy for questions and Ashi and all the other members of the audience.